Hey guys, it's Judy from Nutrition with Judy. Thanks for joining me today. My name is Judy Cho and I'm board certified in holistic nutrition. I focus on root cause healing and oftentimes that's using a meat-based elimination diet to do some gut healing. While you're here, please make sure to like and subscribe, hit the red button. Or if you're listening to this on podcast, please make sure to leave a five-star review or leave an Apple review. This helps my content get in front of more people. So thank you. Okay. So today I had the pleasure of sitting down with Miss Rebecca Contreras. I heard Rebecca speak at my church and Rebecca and I talk a lot about having resolve, having a higher purpose and figuring out how to get over the situation we may currently be in. It's a fight to the top. And she literally worked for the president of the United States. So you want to hear how somebody that struggled with poverty and drug addiction and a mom that abandoned her went from lowest of the lows and then was able to fight for better health and for a better life. Rebecca Contreras is the author of Lost Girl, From the Hood to the White House to Millionaire Entrepreneur. She shares her journey of becoming a welfare-dependent teenage mother to advising a sitting president to drive a successful 100-person company. Rebecca was the director of HR for President Bush and was at the White House a commissioned officer supporting the presidential transition. She now has her own company where they do consulting and a multi-million dollar business. So this conversation talks about her struggles and how she overcame a lot of things to just fight for a better life. I hope that this interview gives you the motivation that no matter where you are, no matter what is going on, that there is always hope. There is always a better tomorrow, but you have to fight for it and you have to be consistent. I hope that this conversation gives you the motivation to help you get there. Let's get right into the interview. Hi, Rebecca. Thank you so much for joining me today. I've been uh, looking forward to this conversation. So for those that are listening and watching, do you mind introducing yourself and uh, sharing who you are? Yes. So hi, thank you so much for having me. Just thrilled to be with you here today on a beautiful Friday afternoon in Texas. And so I'm Rebecca and I run a company by the name of Avant LLC. I am a co-founder and CEO. I'm a majority owner of the firm. And uh, we are 11 years old. We are a consulting firm that focuses on people. So we are an HR consulting firm that does a lot of things like people, people strategies, uh, organizational strategies, human capital, workforce planning. And um, I also am an author, new author, uh, just launched in October of this past year of 21, a book by the name of Lost Girl. And so right now I'm straddling both entities and both efforts. And in addition to that, my husband and I have a nonprofit here in Austin. So I'm thrilled to be with you and uh, I'm excited to dive in and get to have a discussion with you and your listeners. Yes. So I'm really excited to share a little bit about your book, Lost Girl. You know, you talk about going from poverty all the way to working in the White House. If you could share a little bit about how you struggled with abandonment and just all the hardships and then still coming up on top. So, you know, everybody has a journey and a story, and I think there's so much power to telling your story because no matter what walk of life we're in, um, we all have issues and we've all had challenges. And if we don't, then we know a family member that does, right? So we're all impacted. And so I'm from El Paso, Texas. I grew up in a border town and I'm one of four children. I have a twin brother. He and I have the same father and he was from Yugoslavia. I have an older brother. His, his father was Mexican and my younger sister's father was African-American. So I always joke and tell people, you know, we just needed the Asian to complete the circle of diversity in our family. (laughs) And 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 I try to joke about it because, you know, obviously I'm having um, an upbringing in a single parent home with a lot of issues is not a joke, but it's important um, to look at the positivity of things and try to keep things light. But my, my mother was a single mom and none of us knew our fathers. And unfortunately, she struggled with a lot of drug addiction and a lot, there was a lot of mental illness and trauma in our life and in our family. And as a very young girl, I suspect sustained sexual abuse. I was sexual abuse when I was five by a trusted uncle and really dealt with a lot of the issues of that, that, that were in my home as a child by a parent that was really dysfunctional. And, you know, dysfunction can be defined in a lot of ways, 
but when you're a child and you're just trying to navigate life and you're just trying to do the basics of, you know, finding out, you know, growing, growing up or going to school or trying to focus on your grades and you have all that trauma and all that mess happening, it really affects you very deeply as an, as an individual and then an adult, right? And so, so my mom, actually, when I was five, my twin brother and I were five, she told us to the, she was going to the grocery store and never came back and she abandoned us and left to go, you know, to her life on the streets using drugs. And we were actually taken in by my grandmother, who was my hero today. And I talk about the full story. The first three chapters of my book are dedicated to my journey. Actually, the first chapter is called Born in Failure. And it really talks about, you know, coming into a life of failure, literally as a child. And there's so many children that are plagued with that and how you really have no control over it. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, long story short, and you read, your listeners can certainly buy the book and get the whole story of Rebecca in the raw in terms of transparency. But in the interest of time, I will tell you, um, she actually ended up coming back and um, after two years of being on the streets and her um, drug of choice was heroin, unfortunately, and tried to you know get her life right and um, tried to ensure that she was no longer using drugs and get help. And she was able to be, become drug free, but she never really got help for the trauma that she sustained. Mm -hmm. um, she was also abused as a child. And I think a lot of her drug use was centered around her personal abuse in her life. And that was her outlet. I mean, we just happened to be kids that kind of were along the ride with her and, but mm -hmm. she never got help. And it's so important to get therapy and to get help and to deal with the issues of your past. I call it, you'd have to deal with the root in order for the fruit to follow. <laughs> That's my motto. And she never did. And she did actually tear us away from my grandmother, moved us to Austin when I was about nine. And by that point, you know, as a nine and 10 year old, I didn't really know who she was. Um, we had a lot of issues in communication and I was angry at her, had a lot of anger yeah. issues and dysfunction. I struggled a lot in school with learning disabilities. And long story short, I um, got into a lot of mess at age 13 and started using my Myself, started using drugs and get involved with the wrong people. You know, people really define you. Your relationships yeah. are key in the definition of who you will become or who you are. And I had the wrong people. You know, all I knew at that point in my life was toxicity and negativity and abuse. And, you know, my, I always tell people my two purposes in life and destiny was prisoner or death. Those were the two trails I was on. And as a 13 and 14 and 15 year old, just kind of spun out of control. My poor mother, because again, she had been clean and she had been trying to get her life on track and really trying to have a relationship relationship with me because there was a lot of mental illness and issues in our family. We just never really had that holistic healing that we needed and which she tried, but um, I was out of control and I dropped out of school at 17, ended up pregnant. And I mean, just the whole, what I call statistic, you know, in the inner yeah. city, you have a lot of these kids that are a product of their environment. I became a product of my environment and by not necessarily by choice, but as I became a young adult and started continuing to make those poor choices, I had a moment where, you know, I had dropped out of school. I was living on my own. My mother was actually raising my daughter because I was not um, in a position to care for her. And, you know, I had to come to a uh, kind of an aha moment on my own that I was kind of in, in the path for self-destruction right. uh, with my anger and my unforgiveness and the drug abuse and all the trauma. And I had to make a decision, you know, what was I going to do for that little girl? And I had, if you, if you call it epiphany, a divine encounter, however you want to call it, God showed up in my life big time. And there were people that came into my life that really believed in me that started saying, you know, Rebecca, you have potential. You can do something with your life. Why are you, why are you wasting it? You're on a no dip path. And, you know, I had people in my life that really believed in me. And I, I surrendered, um, you know, my, my path to God and started getting help. I met my husband in a little bitty inner city church. Um, he was working with the gangs in East Austin. Most of, most of the guys in the gangs I knew from my inner city um, life. And so we started working with the gangs together and I started getting help. I enrolled in a, a program that helped me deal with my trauma and got mentors and just started really thinking about what I wanted in my life for my little girl. At the time when I made that kind of transformative decision, because it is a decision, we all can own when we change the trajectory of our path, right? Nobody owns it for us. We all make those choices. I was 19 and she, my daughter was about 13 months old. And I moved back in with my mom, got off the drugs and got away from all the toxic relationships in my life. Got rid of the, um, at the time there was a baby daddy involved, which in the book, I tell the whole story how he almost killed me and the whole thing. Wow. Um, really, really bad person, but got away from him. Um, he, he um, you know, was really toxic in my life and abusive and was able to get away from him and uh, meet, you know, good people that invested in me. And I actually enrolled in a welfare to work program because I wanted to go back to school and I want to do something with my life. So my very first boss was a woman by the, by the name of Ann Richards 
who became the governor of Texas and was actually the, the treasurer, the state treasurer at the time, and took me in through that welfare to work program that um, the one thing was you, you you got your JD and then they, they gave you a temporary state job. And then it was up to you to get your permanent job. And not very long after that, I got my permanent job. And I actually started on my path, uh, got off of welfare, had a paying job, you know, started on my training and just had a lot of great women around me that mentored me and sent me um, to the LBJ School of Public Affairs where I, I didn't, I don't have a traditional degree, but I've got a lot of training in the HR field. So I got some certifications in HR and teach courses on communication and really started dealing with my trauma through counseling and help. And I just really worked my way all the way to the top simultaneously as the same time that my career was coming to play. My family was and married my husband. He adopted my daughter and we started our journey together. And, you know, it's so important to, um, to focus not only on where you've been, but where you're going and have a plan and a path for that. And so got a lot of good tools around developing a plan for where I wanted to go and ended up actually uh, getting promoted and working for the new governor of Texas, a mentor of mine that I worked with when I worked with her at the state treasury. And, and my second boss, uh, another woman by the name of Kay Bailey Hutchison, she had mentored me and she called me and said she was working for the new governor. So she brought me over there and um, I started working for her and got some executive leadership training, went back to school and you know, promotion after promotion, opportunity after opportunity. And, and we all know the governor ran for president. And uh, when he was elected, he um, he asked me to join his team. And my husband and I both actually served in President Bush's first term and went to D.C. and worked in the White House, had this great big job that I felt at times was a little over my head. But there's a lot of a lot of details in the book. I'm kind of giving you the 50,000 foot version but um, but I really I really felt at the time that I was uh, meant to be a government public servant my mm -hmm. whole career, and was on the path to do that. And I at that point had spent had worked my way up from that receptionist to that director and all the way to, up to executive management and got a lot of tools in my hand and training to do that. And then a lot of great people that you know supported me was in a position to, of hiring. So was able to hire some really smart people. One of my rules is hire people smarter than you because uh, if you hire people smarter than you and you're in a management role, they're gonna make you look good and they're gonna do a good job. And so as a leader, I've done that over my career. And But w when I left the Bush administration, my husband and I both moved back to Texas. I was approached by a consulting firm to cut my teeth in consulting. And I thought, you know, that that sounds interesting. Maybe I can do that. <laughs> so there was never a path um, where I said no to anything and always had an open mind to my career. And um, I started actually this company 11 years ago. We are about a hundred person practice now spread across five different states here in Texas. We have team members, DC, Virginia, and other states. And, you know, we're growing and thriving. I had never been an entrepreneur, but I really believe in the entrepreneur spirit. We're the fastest growing demographic in the United States uh, as small business entrepreneurs. And I'm just happy to be associated with that demographic and really um, just help people give jobs and grow in their career. And so that's what I've been doing, the entrepreneur work. And then of course, we started the nonprofit. My husband and I have a nonprofit here. We work with kids in the inner city and then launch the book. So that's a lot to cover in Rebecca's story, but it kind of gives you a, a flavor and a sense of what my background is and I, what my passion is in terms of around empowerment. That is incredible. I mean, you went from some of the hardest stories. And like you said, the statistics and being on welfare and governmental assistant all the way to working for the president and moving to DC and, and you basically broke every single boundary and glass ceiling that we think is present. And one thing you bring up in the book is your brother. So you have a twin brother that still struggles with mental illness. What do you think is a differentiator that like, what made you climb to the top? And you, as much as you had a hard history, like what was the difference that kept you fighting to have a new life and a better life and then fight for more? Yeah. So I will tell you, my twin brother and I were inseparable. We were fraternal twins. So we were in different sacks. That's what that means. Gotcha. Um, but we have the same DNA. We have the same experiences. We both had a drug addict mom. We both were abandoned. We both did drugs. We were on a path for self-destruction as teens and, and young adults. We both were sexually abused by that same uncle at five. My differentiator has been, I have been willing to own my own stuff. Okay. First of all, acknowledge that there's a problem. Second, own it and then work towards dealing with it and healing from it. I'm a big proponent of psychiatric help and counseling. I believe that there um, there's other methods, obviously to healing and mental illness, like, you know, 
you know, holistic medicine and other medicines. But for me, it was about really pressing in and dealing with my trauma with counseling and, and really facing my demons, so to speak. <laughs> and, you know, I'm not saying that in terms of, you know, the spiritual stuff, but I'm talking about the ugliness that happens in life when you're sexually abused or when you're physically abused or when you have dr a drug issue problem um, or trauma. And, you know, I faced it head on. I think he never did. He tried really hard. We were on the same path for the first couple of years of dealing. And then he went back to his drug use. His drug of choice was meth. And meth is a very toxic, very destructive drug because it takes you into this euphoric state where you believe that you're a superpower and you don't need to, you know, deal with anything. And he really loved that feeling. And he, um, he, he continued to use drugs and, you know, he's had, he's currently diagnosed schizophrenic bipolar and he, um, he's just never stopped doing drugs and he, he'll stop and then he'll start and he'll stop and he'll start. And, and also just really embracing and saying, you know, I realize that I've had trauma, mm -hmm. but I don't want to hide from my trauma. I want to, I want to be transparent about it. And I want to come out and lead with dealing with it and not bury it under the ground because it never happened, right? It happened and we have to deal with it. This was my mom's problem. I always say my mom actually passed away of breast cancer. And in the book, I talk about her mental illness because she was bipolar as well and depression and cancer didn't take my mom. Uh, depression took my mom because my mom beat cancer one time and then she fell into deep depression. She refused to take medication. She refused to see a psychologist. She refused to talk about her past. She said, I won't talk about it. I won't talk about it. And then she gave up the will to live and she couldn't fight the cancer. And everything about cancer is that will to fight it, you know? So I think that, you know, the mental illness issue in America is huge. It really is the real pandemic in America. There is so many people that are struggling, whether it's depression or bipolar or mental illness, schizophrenia, you know, all sorts of other, you know, conditions. We have to really deal with that. And, and the way to deal with it is to take the bull by the horns and, and internalize, internally deal with your own stuff. Listen, I... I, I recognized very early on, I cannot serve anybody or help anybody or be anything without me dealing with me. It's the yes. buck stops with me. It doesn't stop with anybody else. And I can't point the finger to my abuser or my mother or the dysfunction or it's the drugs in my memory's gone because I use too many drugs. Well, there are ways to rebuild your memory. You know, mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of Dr. Leaf, Dr. Mm -hmm. Caroline Leaf, who is Think, Learn, Succeed. She's a neuroscientist and she talks all about the power of the mind to heal itself. And to um to really work on that positive thinking and and just getting I I got rid of all the toxicity he didn't so getting rid of all those toxic thoughts and toxic ways and behaviors that will really keep you bound for life so that was my differentiator. Do you think that the like let's say you had all that will and you had the support so you were seeing some of the therapists and stuff but if you kept being in the same environment and seeing maybe some of the toxic or the less than ideal people do you think you could still grow in that sort of no not at okay. all yeah not at all and and I will tell you you know my faith has played a huge role in my healing process I totally. think everybody needs a level of faith at some level to heal faith in themselves faith in a higher power me it's faith in God um but I also removed myself from the environment. And I said, I am not going to surround myself with all those people that were toxic. I'm going to get out of the East, the East Austin. I'm going to get out of the hood. I'm going to find a way. My husband w w uh, was a big part of that because when we got married, he had grown up um, opposite of me. He, he came from a single parent home as well, but he never grew up in the hood. And so, you know, his mother was a single mom, worked with five kids as a single mom and never had to take welfare. She worked two or three jobs, whatever she had to do. So he had a hard bring, upbringing, uh, but in a different kind of way. And he was used to nice things. So when I married him, you know, we it, actually my first airplane ride was on my honeymoon with him. I had okay. never been on an airplane. I never traveled. I never, ex uh, the experiences that I was able to get out of getting out of that environment and giving myself new experiences was hugely instrumental in helping me heal and helping me change that path. Was there ever a time where you felt like giving up and then just going back to the memories of, you know, like drugs to help me cope or help me escape. And I just want to go back to that because sometimes just being sober or remembering the past hurts and how you automatically will behave a certain way is harder to do that. Oh gosh, I could many, many times. I had what I call setbacks. You know, there's a great book by John Maxwell called Fail Forward. Mm -hmm. I have learned to fail forward. 
and 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 the failure in the in the you know emotional early early on i would say the first you know 5 to 10 years of our marriage we had a lot of trauma because you know i was very emotional and i and my mom was I had to carry my mom. I had to carry my brother. I was kind of, I've been the mama hen of the family and I have an older brother who's incredibly stable and very successful. We're both entrepreneurs, but we have the family component and I've always been kind of that mama hen. And so, you know, I had emotional break breakdowns. I mean, I tell the story in the book, you know, um, early on in my marriage, I would, um, when I faced conflict and had trauma come back, I would sit in the corner and rock in a fetal position mm -hmm. as an adult, sitting there rocking myself. And I had to, I had to come to a place to say, what am I doing? I, I don't need to be the victim. I need to get up and I need to deal with this, you know, whether it's dealing with hurt or anger or unforgiveness. So you're always, listen, when, when you come out of the mess that I came out of, you never, ever, ever stop advancing forward. And you never come to a place where you think you, it'll never hit you again, right? I still, when I'm over, under pressure and have a lot on my plate, I have to center my mind. Mine, mine is around prayer meditation and it's all around the right people around me, the right mentors that I can call and say, hey, I'm feeling really depressed today. Like, I'm sad. Can you, can you talk me through this? And then, you know, getting you in a, getting yourself in a position with people around you to really help you uh, deal with that, those life issues is hugely important. Of course, now I'm in a completely different position to do that for myself and I'm strong and I'm in, and I can, I can walk in that independence and own that power, but not everybody can do that. And it didn't happen overnight. It's been a process for me of many, many years. So yes, I do deal with that sometimes and have, and it's just a matter of having a resolve to draw a line in the sand to say no. I'm not going to revert back to old behavior that's destructive for me and my family. Do you think you were born with this like fight to, you know, like I can be better because I can imagine some people listening to this and saying, well, I can't one, maybe get out of the environment as easily. Let's say it's a partner that you're married to with kids or something. And then secondly, of I don't have that strong minded fierceness that Rebecca does. So I don't know if I can change. Do you think you were born with this or do you think this is a fight that you've learned to fight? Well, there's a lot of theories on what you're born with and whether it's innate in you right. or whether it's developed. So I was born a fighter and chapter one, born in failure. We'll talk about my near death experience. I shouldn't be alive. I had to be in, in an incubator. I was two pounds when I was born. My twin brother took all the nutrients and um, I almost died. And so I fought to, for my life as a baby, two and a half pounds in that incubator for two months. My grandma would tell me she could hold me in the palm of her hand. I fought. I came out with that fight. But I will tell you, I haven't always had that fight. It took me years to get it and to 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 really pursue it. And and by 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 learning, my husband's a fighter. He's um he's very strong in terms of his resolve. You know, people that in our life that have mentored me that are fighters. And I had to develop that fight. And 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 listen, you don't arrive. You develop it every day. It's every day you get better and better and better at dealing with issues and dealing with obstacles and learning how to how to overcome them. And I'm a perfect example that there's no excuse in life for why we have to stay victims of our environment. There are ways out of that, but it's hard work and it's ownership, accountability, transparency, and being able to walk it out good, bad, or indifferent when it hits. How much do you think faith or some belief in hope? And for me, it's God too, but the hope in something bigger than you, that there's something bigger than us. How much of that was instrumental in your healing? It was number one, number one. I have, um, there are l numerous keys to my success. And, you know, I talk extensively through various training programs that I do, but I will tell you, my faith has been the central point of my DNA every step along the way. Mm -hmm. I had a faith encounter at age 19 and I talk about it in the book. It was transformative. And I, when when there when everything else is lost, you have to have faith. You have to have faith. I mean, look at where we are right now in America with the pandemic and all the loss and the struggle. And if we don't have faith to believe we're going to be better than this, we're going to get out of it. We are going to overcome it. Yes. You have to have that faith. And for me, it's faith in God, you know, faith in yourself, faith in believing in yourself when nobody else believes in you or when you were struggling with your own identity. Right. So Faith is such an important part of my DNA is it's inseparable from who I am. That's amazing. I wanted to talk a little bit about your mom. You mentioned that she passed away from breast cancer, that you believe that some of it was the mental illness, but you mentioned that she also was taking a lot of estrogen. Can you talk a little bit about why she was doing that and what happened? 
Yeah, so I am pretty sure, and after talking to several of my friends who are holistic medicine doctors and, and nutritionists, I, I'm confident that a lot of the issues that led to her cancer were high, very high, high levels of estrogen that she was taking. And she also was 300 pounds and struggled with her weight her whole life. So she was always on diet pills. And she was always buying these pills from Mexico, you know, taking popping pills, popping pills. Everything was a pill for her and solution. And I used to tell her, not everything will solve your problem in a pill, mom. You got to like, you got to figure out where the root is and deal with it and not take the pill. But she popped a lot of pills. I think she went from being a drug addict to a pill addict, mm. <laughs> to a diet pill addict. And the estrogen levels were astronomical. She had, um, just to give you a sense, her change of life as a woman started when she was 45. Okay. So she would start at menopause then. Mm. And instead of dealing with it holistically and trying to get help, she, she turned to es very unhealthy levels of estrogen that she pumped herself with for 10 years for 10 years and i believe that that contributed in a huge way to her her breast cancer development none of, nobody in our family has breast cancer she was the first one to get breast cancer and uh, we've had obviously uh, family members die of other cancers but not breast cancer and i would tell her mom you've got to stop popping those pills mom you have to stop taking that estrogen mom you have to start eating greens get rid of all the fatty foods she ate a lot of sugar she was a sugar fanatic she would eat like a whole cake by herself because she right. was 300 pounds obese. And I would tell her sugar will feed the cancer cells. And she wouldn't okay. stop eating the sugar when she had cancer. And I'm like, you got to stop feeding the cancer cells. So I, I did a lot of research on this mm -hmm. and tried to help her through it. But I think a lot of her, her self lack of love of self really led to her really doing some poor, poor things to her body that in the end led to her, her demise. So let's say when you go through menopause, let's say your estrogen markers are low. Would you ever consider using hormone replacement therapies? Well, so personally, I am, I'm, I'm 53. I just turned 53 and I am in treatment with my OBGYN. And then I also have um, a holistic medicine doctor that I, that I talk with. I try to do everything holistically. Okay. I am looking for every single way I can to treat the issues that are going on in my body holistically, including mm -hmm. when I feel like I have depression coming on. Mm -hmm. I'm a big CBD oil, essential oil fan. Mm -hmm. I, I take a lot of herbs. I take a lot of, you know, healthy alternatives to the unnatural estrogen. Sure. I think uh, that's my personal choice. I can't, I can't say every woman can do that. Everybody needs to talk to their doctor, get their counsel. But for me, because of the traumatic experience I lived, I lived through with my mom and watching her die like she did, I was her caretaker and was the only one that really cared for her in that death process, obviously with a nurse, but I was there by her side. And I, I don't want to put anything in my body that is going to even have the remote notion that it can lead to something else. And I'd rather deal with it holistically. If I, you know, can't deal with it holistically, then I talk to my doctor about, you know, what's the minimum that I can do in order to not, you know, be at, at the, at the dangerous low level, but I'm, my, my estrogen levels have been healthy. I, I have my annual mammogram, my annual pap. I have, I stay healthy with all my, my natural holistic approach and it works for me. I work out by the way, and she never did. I would always okay. tell her, mom, you got to walk. Cause you know, um, it'll get your endorphins going and it'll, mm -hmm. it'll attack those depression cells in your brain. There's a lot of science around this. Right. She was a couch potato, 300 pounds would never walk. So I exercise five days a week. I do orange theory and I keep myself healthy, keep myself moving and, and forward thinking. Did your mom, the amount that she was taking, was she taking over the amount that the doctor recommended or was it an actual prescription level? She actually never saw a doctor. All her pills were from oh. Mexico. Okay. She was of the old school mindset. Gotcha. Um, okay. I don't know if you know that generation, but you know, they don't see a lot of doctors. Uh, my mother had a huge lump on her breast for a year before she told anybody about it. I only found it out. I was working for Bush in the White House and I came home for Christmas and she took me in the bathroom and showed me and it was the size of a grapefruit. And I asked her, Gosh. what, how long have you had that? And she said a year and she was afraid. She said, I don't want to go. I'm afraid of the doctor. She was at that old school generation that uh, is afraid, you know, right. fear, fear, fear tactic. Mm -hmm. And so um, she was not on prescription. She did take prescription medicine during her cancer treatment. She got addicted to Vicodin through that, by the way, too. So she became a Vicodin addict, which is a whole different, you know, opio opioids are horrible for you. Yeah. But she took uh, over the counter and she took a lot of pills from Mexico, all these, you know, miracle solutions to estrogen. And I, I just think it, it did her in.
Wow. That is incredible. Well, I'm, I'm glad for you that you found like holistic health that you can have a different path and then including exercise. And like, you're right. It absolutely will support depression. They say that compared to taking antidepressants, if you do workouts, um, it's just as effective. So I applaud oh, you absolutely. for doing all of these absolutely. things. Yeah. And I, I will tell you when I feel overwhelmed and it, I feel like, I'm, cause you know, you know, your body, Mm-hmm. You feel that pressure coming up and you feel like that emotion is going to oh, blow yeah. across the street, go power walk. I mean, I'm like, okay, I walk the stairs, I put on my, you know, my worship music, do something to get yourself out of that blow feeling. And so it was super important uh, to do that. And, and, and it doesn't work a hundred percent of the time. Sometimes you just got to press through that, that sad moment, but uh, it works for me in a holistic way. You know, what I'm curious about is I know you mentioned that obesity or you mentioned in the book that obesity kind of runs in your family, but then you just don't. So a lot of people, whether it was drugs, um, some other addiction, and then they use the food as the addiction. So it sounds like you don't do that. Did you have to fight that? Or you're just not wired to turn to food as an addictive substance? Absolutely not. I had to fight. I've had to fight every, every temptation for addiction and, you know, unhealthy habit, right? I am five, nine. Uh, my dad was from Yugoslavia. I'm told I never met him, but he was six, three, six, four. So I'm taller than my mom. And, uh, but I have her genes in terms of weight gain. I have always been weight conscious. I'm not a fanatic about it. I just eat right. I eat healthy, organic. I eat lots of greens. You know, I try to stay away from all the, what I call the whites, but I've, uh, if I find myself a little over the scale, um, you know, for me, I can get, I can gain weight very fast because I have her genes. Bear in mind, my she was 300 pounds. My grandfather was almost 400. But my grandfather used to have his clothes special made because he was 400 pounds plus. Wow. He was a huge man. And so, you know, I anytime I, I get 10, I, my, my barometer is 10 pounds over the scale, my mm-hmm. ideal weight. It, you know, I give myself room here and there, four or five, six pounds. But once I get 10, I'm like, okay, it's time to buckle up. And uh, usually I find my weight gain is worse when I'm traveling a lot and I'm, I'm not able to cook because I'm a big chef, by the way. I love to cook my own meals. And I have a cooking show I do on Facebook Live where I cook holistically. So when I can't when I can't cook and I'm traveling, it's really hard for me. I find I gain weight. But I, I stop myself at that 10 pound and I lose it. I'm like, okay, I'm going to go for, on a three-month kick and um, cut out sugars and cut out, you know, what I need to cut out. But I don't vacillate in my weight like my mom did. She'd go from 300 pounds to 200 to 280 to 300. She'd go up and down, up and down. I keep myself consistent in my weight and in my diet because consistency is key to any success. Yes. Consistency is a key theme that must be adopted in every area of our lives. So a lot of the community that I work with, some of them struggle with food addictions, whether they know it or not, right? So if you think about when we're young, we, when we celebrate with food, we cry with food, right? Babies crying, we give the bottle or we nurse. And then as the baby grows up, it's like, oh, you had a hard time at the dentist. Here's the candy, right? So we really use food as a coping mechanism. So a lot of times people are like, oh, I had a hard day. I'm going to end up with a drink or they turn to food a lot. So how do you not do that? Right. So it sounds like sometimes you go for a walk, you listen to worship music, but Sometimes it's like, I'm so stressed. I just want to eat a donut and feel better. So how do you not do that? I'll tell you how I not do it as I don't have it in the house. Okay. I don't buy it. Everything in your pantry should be healthy. And I don't buy sweets. I, I, my kids will tell you they grew up drinking water and milk. They never had sodas. They never had chips. Now, granted, when they were teens and actually when they're young adults and left the house, they went crazy and became junk food because <laughs> they never had it growing up. But now now they're back. They only did that a couple of years. Now they're back and they're like me. They eat very healthy or organic. Okay. But I just don't buy it. I don't have it in the house. Uh, when So my rule of thumb is in the grocery store, I say on the out, outskirt perimeter of the grocery store, I try to buy very little in the, in the middle section because the middle section is all, you know, the things that normally aren't as healthy for you. Right. But uh, I just don't buy it. And, and when I'm at a restaurant, so my husband and I do a lot of sharing. So we go out, we'll always share a meal. 90% of the time we share a dish. And if you think about the restaurant calories, you could, you could literally sit down with a good meal and eat 3000 calories in one meal. Yes. That's like half the calories for the day. And so 
We share if we want Italian, we'll share. I try to stay away from things like cream sauces and do more like, uh, all, you know, olive oil sauces mm-hmm. or healthier stuff. So yeah, I just, you know, there are ways, it's just a lifestyle. So this is this is a, an adoption of a lifestyle and it's an adoption of a of a, of a philosophy that you have as, an, as a human, and especially today in COVID, we want to be healthy because we right. see that, you know, 80% of people that are obese have tragic end of COVID. So, you know, it's an, it's a philosophy that you embrace and say, okay, I'm going to adopt this philosophy of health and just don't buy this stuff. Stay away from it. As we're wrapping up, you know, when you were in darkness and then you shifted to, I want to get better. What was that fight in you to shift so dramatically if the, for the people that are listening, that are struggling with maybe it's food addiction. I think a lot of people lost somebody during COVID, whether it was from suicide, whether it was from the actual virus, whether it's from something else, but when they're just down on their luck and they're like, I don't want to turn to God. I don't want to turn to higher being. I don't want to do anything. I'm just sad. How do you start fighting for a better day? Well, I think isolation is your biggest enemy, right? So, um, my twin brother, isolates and when he isolates he turns to drugs Mm. because it's private and nobody can see him doing it right Right. um isolation is the worst thing my mom isolated when she was struggling with her depression and she would eat a whole bag of chips because nobody was watching her so she could do that so number one don't isolate get out of isolation and reach out and and call someone get someone get someone to talk you through it get help a loved one a coach a family member a friend someone don't isolate but you know for me my darkness was so deep and when when your readers read lost girl it is literally you read the book and it's un, it's almost unbelievable it's i had a friend today tell me i read it and it read like a novel and it took you on these rides of like did did that really happen but that was my life it's yeah. there's no fabrication in there it's 100 percent truth and you know you have to understand that where you are today is not where you need to be tomorrow, but you have to be the one to own your power. Nobody can own your power, but you and get getting help to get rid of that victim mentality, to understand that you can be a victor and not a victim is so important. I had a daughter for me. That was my driver. I had a daughter and I swore when my mother abandoned us, I swore I would never do that to my children and would never be like her. And here I was at 19 with, with a, with a, you know, a eight month, 10 month old girl doing the same thing. And so I had to have that change moment to say, what am I doing? I, I, I don't want her to grow up like that. I don't want her to be fatherless. I don't want her to be in poverty. So I had a driver. She was my driver in terms of the, full, you know, the, the path. And, and then God was my driver. And so, you know, I, you've got to find hope and find people and find faith and find the ability to just own your power and just start the tiny steps. So it's, it's about those tiny degree shifts. As my coach, Jen Goss says, those tiny degree shifts, don't start, you know, trying to do everything all at once, just start small. Maybe it's start power walking when you feel sad. Maybe it's uh, cut out donuts and don't buy them anymore. Maybe it's, you know, stop drinking sodas. Maybe it's cutting sodas out twice a week. If you have them seven days a week, cut them out twice a week and then downscale. Right. Tiny, tiny degree shifts and steps that will make a big difference in that transformation. Thank you. I mean, thank you for sharing your story and being so open about it. I think a lot of people just like you said, isolation feeds addiction. It feeds darkness and um, despair. And the thing is, when we are hurting, the hardest thing to do is to reach out. And so thank you for sharing this because it shares with people that we can struggle and we can just get out of everything. I mean, I struggled with an eating disorder and I was in a psych ward on New Year's Eve because, and that was my wake up call because I had a six month old and I'm like, am I going to be a mom or am I going to care about my weight? Right. So these wake up calls and, and we can move past that. And I think your story was so powerful. I wanted to share. And so I think that's where your book can be such an inspiration to people saying, Hey, I've been through everything, but I went literally to the top and worked at the white house. I mean, that is so powerful. And now you run a multi-million dollar business. I mean, these are things of you can change. And this yes. is the hope that I really wanted you to share with our community. So thank you. Um, yeah. Well, well, with- listen, we, we live in the greatest country in the world. And yes. so anything is possible in America, but if people want to get the book, I would yes. encourage them to go to my website at Rebecca and buy it from my website. I have it discounted there. I'll make sure I personalize it to you when you buy it off my website. It's also on Amazon, but um, I can't personalize it off Amazon because it right. ships from. But also, um, make sure and connect with me. And I want to hear from you. If if you're encouraged, if you if you have those tiny degree shifts you're making, and you're making progress because of my story or the book or something that resonates with you, then connect with me. 
on Facebook at Rebecca Ann Contreras, um, and I'm also on Instagram. I would love to hear from you and be encouraged. Hey, 2022 is a different year, so it's a whole new start. And uh, thank you again for having me. I really enjoyed the chat. Yes. And then where, what's your Instagram account? Is it the same it's as Facebook? Re- it's Rebecca Ann Contreras. Okay. okay. Yeah. And, and, and so- I'll put everything in the show notes so people can easily find you and your book. And yes, I think people should reach out. And for people that are not just meat based, but, you know, eat just whole real foods, they should check out your channel and your cooking. I saw one clip. I think you guys were making guacamole or something, or is this like homemade? And I think that's yeah. really cool. So yeah. um, that's really amazing. Again, thank you so much for sharing your story. It's really powerful. And I think there's no excuse why people cannot live their full lives and live a best life if they fight for a better tomorrow. So thank you. Yes. Well, thank you. Thank you. So enjoyed it. And um, God speak to you and your, and your listeners and all you do this year. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Take care. Okay, guys. I hope that this interview with Rebecca Contreras shows how hard things can be, but how you can turn it around and make it better for you. We all go through struggles and not that it's okay that we go through it, but it is a part of being human. I hope that you guys find the inner fighter in you to fight for a better day so that you can have optimal health and that you can have a better life. We have to find that fight in us. And sometimes it starts with just cleaning up our diet. So we don't have this constant mental fog. When we eat a cleaner diet, it is easier to fight for things, not saying it's perfect, not saying it's easy, but it is easier. And that is why I always advocate for a meat-based elimination diet. If you're interested in reading Rebecca's book, make sure to check it out. There are just so many fighting and powerful and inspirational stories within this book that we didn't even get a touch upon. Okay, guys, make sure to eat a lot of meat. Take care of your bodies because it is the only place you have to live. I will talk to you guys later. Bye, guys. Bye.